Welcome to Plain Speaking, a voice of the Democratic Party which is intended to inform the public of the principles and the practices of the Democratic Party, which we all know is the preeminent party in providing the greatest freedom that America has ever known. And our program is sponsored by many good people, and their names will be up on the screen uh, after the show as well as they were up before the show began. And it is uh, a program that is funded entirely by donations from some very, very uh, generous Democrats. And I'm very happy to have a stellar uh, panel today. Uh, starting to my immediate right is Marsha Hunter, who happens to be the vice chair of the De Blair County Democratic Committee. And way yonder to my left over here is George. <laughs> George is next. But Marty Barona, who is a very active member of the Democratic Party in Blair County, and to his right, ooh, what a word. <laughs> and deciding beside Marty is George Thompson, who was for many years the treasurer of the Blair County Dems, and now he is just another active committee member. And I am Frank Rosenhoover, a member of the Blair County Democratic Committee, a member of the state committee, and chairman of the North Central Caucus of that great party. So today we have mm -hmm. a large number of issues to bring to your attention. And what we want to imp impress upon you uh, throughout the program is that the only way we're going to find or that we're going to cause change to happen in government is to vote and vote for candidates who will represent your viewpoints or the viewpoints of our party. Because if we don't vote, all of the rhetoric, all the demonstrating, all of the moaning and groaning and complaining will be for naught, because the only way that we can affect change is to vote in the primary election for your Democratic candidates, and in the general election, vote for them again. So please, make it a point to guarantee that you'll vote and to talk to your family and friends to get them out. We have some significant issues coming up, and the first one we're going to talk about today is the budget for the state of Pennsylvania. Now, as you all know, by constitutional fiat, the state of Pennsylvania must have presented by the governor a budget, usually in the first week of February, which will cover the fiscal year June, July 1 to June 30. Governor Wolf presented a budget in February of 2015, which would have represented the budget for July 1 to June 30 of 2016. Unfortunately, because of some wrangling politically and some other extraneous issues, the state government was never able to come out with a full budget. They came out with a partial budget. Marsha has a lot of facts and figures and, and issues that we'll be talking about to make you aware of what actually the problems are. but. Since the total budget was not passed, the law says he had to present another budget. So now we have two budgets before us, the unfinished 2015-16 and certainly the newly presented 2016-17. So with that in mind, we're going to take a look at what are some of the significant issues that are impacting it right now. And, and George and Marsha both uh, have listing of specific departments and, and so on. And I think that, George, are you going to speak in general terms of one of the biggest issues, uh, such as deficit, pension? Sure, I, Frank. Yeah. Uh, there's, of course, many issues with the Pennsylvania budget. And uh, let's back up a little bit, uh, back up to the uh, Governor Corbett years. One of the things that happened under Governor Corbett is uh, rather dramatic reduction in education funding. So when, uh, and of course he lost an election and there are various reasons why he, he lost uh, when he ran against Governor Wolf. But one of the major re reasons was apparently education funding. We had 30,000 uh, teachers, uh, aides, uh, laid off in Pennsylvania because of lack of money. And this, uh, <laughs> There was a general ta uh, taxpayer and voter revolt on this uh, dramatic reduction in education funding. So when Governor uh, Wolf came out with his 2015-16 uh, 
budget, the one that is not yet approved, that should have been approved actually back in July of uh, 2015, uh, he had rather large increases to education funding. Tied into that uh, uh, was also Republican issues. So the Republicans uh, wanted to uh, eliminate uh, the sale of liquor from uh, government state stores, instead give the sales to private industry, Walmarts, Sheetzes, uh, and that also was part of the budget discussion in, in a way because uh, they, uh, Republicans viewed this uh, sale of the license that would be awarded to these different private stores as an income producer. And a, Governor Wolf pointed out that, well, the state stores actually generate income for the state. So even though the sale of license might be a one-time fix for income, uh, the state was going to lose revenue in uh, the sale of liquor through the state stores. Uh, also, uh, Governor Wolf had a different uh, dramatic uh, reshuffling of income uh, in the last unapproved budget, the 2015-2016 budget. Uh, some of the factors there was a reduction in property taxes. When, and with his proposal to increase income taxes to expand sales taxes, which Governor Wolf did. Uh, he also wanted to reduce property taxes. This gets back to the idea that the uh, funding for our education system, uh, once upon a time, about, uh, I guess, 20 years ago, used to be 50% of the education expenditures were state monies. Now uh, we've, uh, over the years, reduce the proportion of money the state puts into education to approximately 32 percent of the total expenditures in the, That's right. in the uh, state uh, education uh, expenditures. 32 percent are state. The rest have to be made up by property taxes or, or, or personal income yeah. tax, which generally uh, you know, is, is, you know, is the same. Uh, and Governor Wolf wasn't really talking about an, a change in the personal income tax for uh, this, the local share of uh, in education. So anyway, <laughs> there are uh, numerous other factors. The uh, 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 severance tax on natural gas production was another factor. Uh, Governor Wolf uh, viewed uh, the shale industry, the gas from uh, the shale industry, uh, uh, the gas drilling, as a new and valuable source of income. And the Republicans just uh, said no, they're afraid their industry is going to leave. There were different reasons that didn't really make sense in my mind because uh, the proposal that Governor Wolf made was, would have not uh, made taxes higher really than most of the other states. So really the gas producers had nowhere to go in, in a sense. Uh, you know, all the states had higher taxes than Pennsylvania did. So anyway, that, those That's are some of the factors yeah. that, that now we're entering into a new, fi a new fiscal year, and the old <laughs> fiscal year's arguments haven't been resolved. Yeah. Well, no, go ahead, Marshall. Well, this is sort of like deja vu all over again. And, and what I'm referring to is with the state pensions, way back under Ridge, because the stock market was doing well, the state didn't contribute to the pensions the way they were supposed to. And then when the, st when, the, when the stock market went poorly, there was a big shortfall in state pensions because instead of paying the same amount of money every year as they should have, they did not. Right. The, same, the same thing exactly is happening with education in Pennsylvania. Obama did a stimulus bill and put all the stimulus money into the state of Pennsylvania which we used for education. We were supposed to be at the regular funding we always were at and use the stimulus money to improve education and hire more teachers and stimulate the economy. Instead, they used it to pay for education. And then when the stimulus was gone, they didn't want to have to raise taxes to make up difference. that difference. And what it is, is it's very poor leadership at the state level under two different Republican governors. And so that's what, one of the reasons that we're in this big mess. 
because instead of using the stimulus money the way it was supposed mm -hmm. to be used, they used it to fund things that were the state was already supposed to be raising taxes and paying for. I have some statistics here that I printed out, and this is Wolf's old budget. This isn't the new one. This is the old. This is a comparison between Wolf's 2015 budget and uh, House Bill 1192, which is what the State House presented to Governor Wolf. New school funding under Wolf: 507 million dollars. Under Republicans, eight million dollars. New pre-kindergarten slots, 14,000 under Wolf, 3,500 under the Republican budget. Minimum wage of 10,010 10 cents. The number of $10, work, ten dollars and ten cents. I wish it was ten thousand. <laughs> but anyway, ten dollars and ten cents raise of the minimum wage to ten dollars and ten cents. The number of workers that would get that raise in the state of Pennsylvania would have been 1.27 million. And of course. The Republicans didn't recommend anyone get a raise uh, as far as the raise in minimum wage. Human service funding, $498,667 increase under Wolf, none under the Republicans. Mental health funding, which is very important right now as far as people talking about a lot of gun tragedies yeah. and things like that. They always say, well, don't do gun control improve the mental health system. That's not my mm -hmm. argument. That's an argument by a lot of people. Wolf wanted to raise net new mental health funding by 18.9 million. The Republicans, nothing. Property tax relief. Under Wolf's program, the average tax relief for the typical homeowner would be $968 of tax relief a year under the Republicans, nothing. Drilling tax, which is on Marcella Shale, obviously. $1.8 billion, which is them finally paying their fair share like they do in every other state where they drill. The Republicans, nothing. And lastly, higher education, community colleges, $15 million increase under Wolf, 6.5 under the Republicans, state system universities, $44 million under Wolf. 12.4 million under the Republicans and state related universities, 83 million under Wolf and 17.4 million under Republicans. And everyone always says that the education of our youth is one of the most important things, mm -hmm. not only for economic development, but for mm -hmm. their children. And yeah. this is what we're looking at. And uh, I think we should take a look then at what happened to this budgetary process. Now, Back in, I think it was May, June or July or whatever the date was, mm -hmm. the, the state senate and the governor came up with a compromise, mm -hmm. which they then sent over to the House, the General Assembly. They don't call it the House, it's the mm -hmm. General Assembly. And the General Assembly, because of the actions of the significant members who are Tea Party affiliated blocked the passage of the, of, of, the compromise. of the compromise. And that's when the budgetary process fell apart. So all of these facts and figures that we had drawn out were, were representations of where the Republicans were to begin with, but they did come around to a solution whereby the governor and the Senate could agree. But since it was denied by the House, there has been no attempt, that, to my knowledge, even to this very day, mm -hmm. that the governor and the members of the Senate and the General Assembly have gotten together to try to iron out their differences on the old one, let alone present a new one. George, are you familiar with any? Uh, actually, I've uh, been unable to detect any official movement. I mean, there's been discussions uh, with the Republican uh, House, which you accurately uh, portray as the obstacle in the settlement of last year's budget. I mean, actually, leadership had supposedly agreed on the Senate uh, compromise yes. with uh, mm -hmm. Governor Wolf, and then House members uh, then allow the leadership and, and the Republican leadership in the House to go follow through with uh, the, the compromise. You know, and Marcia, you uh, reminded me during the election between uh, 
Governor Corbett and Governor Wolf, this pension issue uh, certainly was a large issue, and it accounted for uh, competing claims. The Republicans said, well, we've increased education more than uh, previous uh, uh, allocations. And the De uh, Governor Wolf said, well, no, the classroom education budget hasn't been increased back to the 2010-2011 budget, which is the final year of the affordable, uh, the, the, uh, stimulus. the stimulus, stimulus money, yes. Right. And both statements were, were accurate, and the difference is in the pension. The state has been underfunding the pensions uh, for years. And, as as uh, our county, and they admitted well, it. Well, yeah, a lot, well, actually, private industry. I, I mean, part of the thing you're just currently seeing on television about the steel workers in Johnstown is an example of private industry really not setting enough money aside for retirees. The argument on TV is health care. Uh, you know, not enough money. But in any case, <laughs> this is a, a problem in municipal governments, this underfunding of the pension system and promised health care benefits. Private industry has the same problems. Right. But in any case, so both statements were accurate, and this is uh, going to be an increasing problem because uh, there was uh, a change in the pension system. It lowered some of the benefits in 2010, but it also increased... Uh, mandated payments to uh, mm -hmm. to rectify all of the other payments over the last 15 years, and actually, uh, our Altoona representative John McGinnis, in his legislation that no one wants to consider, recognizes this underfunding. And the reason no one wants to consider his legislation is, guess what? You have to increase taxes. That's right, increase mm -hmm. the income, and, and and that is the obstacle in mm -hmm. all of these different. Uh, things no, no one seems to want to increase taxes. So one of the things that we can do as citizens, everyone who's viewing this show, and you ought to talk to your friends and family, we're not going to get a budget for 2015-16 any sooner than we will get for one for 2016-17 unless the governor and his people meet with the Senate and the General Assembly people. So we implore the you, those of you who are watching us, call Senator Eichelberger, call John McGinnis, call Judy, Judy Ward, Ward, and tell them, get to the table, because this thing will not be solved by irresponsible rhetoric in the media. And that's what we're hearing, not only in Pennsylvania, but all over this country. There is a tremendous lack of cooperation, collaboration, and compromise. And so the viewers, please, get on your phones, get on the email system, get on the texting, get on Facebook. Put some pressure on these guys, because if we don't, when will we have a budget? Are oh, we going to go through 2017, 18 without having budgets? And the figures you heard Marsha mention, I, I was at a, an advisory board meeting of Penn State Altoona last night. We are being underfunded by several million. And if we do, then we're not going to be able to maintain the quality of education at our Penn State Altoona campus or at Penn State University. And our, our representative for the Altoona area, John McGinnis, was interviewed by some representatives of Penn State Altoona. And his comment was about funding. He said there should not be one single penny of public money spent for Penn State totally, meaning State College and all the systems. And <laughs> so there was a guy, and this is somebody that Altoonans ought to get on. Oh, absolutely. Uh, he, uh, he made the statement, uh, I went to his town hall meeting a month ago, whenever, and uh, he made the statement that Penn State, uh, Pennsylvania State University, I think he said 7% of its budget is actually state money. Mm -hmm. And he saw no reason why the state, like you say, mm -hmm. should, should fund it. Well, part of the reasons uh, the state has an interest in this is not all families. I guess his uh, idea is that families should pay for the education of, oh, yes. of their children. Absolutely. The problem is you have families that can't afford to pay for uh the education. And so what John McGinnis is saying is those people coming from a low-income family, they're out of luck. You know, uh, either they could figure out how to get scholarships. Only the rich or, can afford to be educated. Or work somehow part-time yeah. and continue to go to school. 
And there really is a, an argument that, uh, in my mind, is, is tragic for the United States because education is the way we can maintain our economy. You, you and know, compete and, in the world. And compete. And here's the thing. 40, 50 years ago, you could do that at a place like IUP. You could work part-time and work your way mm -hmm. through. Now even IUP is about, oh, I don't know, 15000 a year at least. Yeah, I, I don't even know what it is right now, but it, is, it would be absolutely impossible. I saw some figure that you'd have to work at minimum wage. You'd have to work 120 hours a week in order to you know, pay. Hey, for, yeah, so it's, it. it's, it's impossible. Okay. It's, a nice, it's a nice idea. And at one time, it was possible, yeah. but with the rising costs, it's impossible for people to work their way through college. I, I, it's impossible. I worked at the chem lab at uh, Penn, uh, IUP when I went there. I graduated in 62. Well, but anyway, we got our first break, and when we come back, we're going to pick up a little bit more of the talk on the budget and then move on to some other topics. Welcome back to Plain Speaking. Uh, we are discussing a significant problem in Pennsylvania, the lack of budgets, and that's plural. And we're trying to let you know what the issues are. Uh, the governor and the Senate of Pennsylvania had agreed to a compromise, and the General Assembly in Pennsylvania voted it down. And since then, both sides have engaged in some rather reckless rhetoric as far as I'm concerned, uh, demeaning each other publicly about well, whose fault it was and we get to the table, but until we do, we're going to have this whole mess. So we say again to you folks, call McGinnis, call Eichelberger, call Ward, and tell them to get to the table. Now, we're going to wrap up our discussion on the budget, because I know we go the whole hour, but we have several other topics, but uh, Marsha, you have another comment or two before we move on because th these things just didn't happen. They've been caused over time. Right. As I, as I had said previously, the, the, the real gap in the education funding has to do with the fact that the, the House and, and Senate and Governor Corbett use the stimulus money to fund existing things instead of using the stimulus money to go above and beyond and hire more teachers and things of that nature and now it's time to have the money there for education and he's refusing to raise taxes for that shortfall that he should have been raising incrementally all along mm -hmm. and once again it's one of these things where now there's a huge shortfall and everybody's like well where are we going to get the money well if you would have mm -hmm. had incremental tax increases this whole time it would never occur. It would have never occurred, these big deficits. They would not occur if you take care of business on a year-by-year -year basis instead of constantly kicking the can down the road right. and making it someone else's problem. Yeah. Marty raised an issue while we were on our break. Why are the costs of education going up every year? Well, the same reason that it is to raise a family or to own a home or to be an individual business person. Everything we consume as people increases every year in cost. There is hardly a thing we buy anymore that is more this year than it was last year. So if everything we consume, whether it's utilities or it's materials for our vehicles or it's food, it's rent, and it's, you know, it goes up every year. So how can government maintain the same level of service if they don't have a comparable increase in revenue and that the only revenue they have is taxes. And this excitement about, oh, I hate government and I hate paying taxes and this whole Tea Party thing, look at what happened in Flint. Yeah, those poor people in that have, water. Do you want to have drinking water? And I saw the map. They came out with the map where the most, uh, what's in the water in Flint? Uh, uh, lead, lead, lead. Lead. The most lead. The whole state of Pennsylvania was practically black. <laughs> well, yeah, and <laughs> here our in Pennsylvania, infrastructure is very old. Uh, actually, in Altoona, we we have uh, they they test uh, children for lead mm -hmm. in their blood. Uh, I didn't realize this. Yeah, that if uh, yes. a child is on Medicaid, that's one of the mandated tests. And here, Altoona is very high in the lead concentration in the blood. 
the children here in Altoona have a higher lead concentration than the ones in That's Detroit. why they're so heavy. Now, now, uh, uh, now uh, here it's uh, not the water. No, it, it, it is uh, uh, paint. Uh, yeah. All the old houses with the lead-based paint. And that's right. true, George, but then you start to wonder when you see a map like I saw of how dark the state of Pennsylvania is as far as lead in the water, you have to start wondering, is it really the old paint in these houses? I mean, if you test somebody's blood for lead, how do you tell really where the lead's coming well, from? Exactly. Well, now, yeah. you know what I mean? And that was what we always thought was the, the lead and the paint in the old houses, in, in, especially in the city of Altoona, the older structures and so forth. The uh, uh, issues there, uh, it, and I went to the Altoona Water Authority website to see whether lead uh, was being tested for when Flint, Michigan's uh, mm -hmm. uh, issue mm -hmm. became national. And actually, I, uh, the Altoona Water Authority had no information on lead. Now, subsequently, I discovered that uh, they do test for lead. In fact, when I went to the website, they had a statement on there that uh, the accuracy of testing for lead at the reservoir level isn't valid. You have to test for lead in the water at your at household the, at tap. The, at, exactly. the, at the tip. And, at the and, tap. Because it's going through the pipes. And so they gave you a reference to a federal agency to find out more information about lead in the water. This is the Altoona Water Authority So what you're saying, saying is this. we don't know. Well, they subsequently said that they do know. I read an article in the Altoona yeah. Yeah. Mirror, in the mirror that, that, yeah. that said that they do test, yeah, uh, and we don't have substantial amounts of no, lead in I, the water. No, I do know, having worked on the commission that was appointed when they wanted to sell the authority years ago, yes. I was one of six people appointed onto that committee, and the, the testing techniques that the city of, uh, the, that the Altoona Water Authority uses, they go through five processes. And so it's not that they don't do it, mm -hmm. and th th they reaffirm the fact that there may be a higher concentration of lead in the bodies of people in our community, but the the cause is not significant, is not even remotely blamable to the Water wow. Authority because they do a lot of screening and a lot of purifying before it comes out of the tap. Now, what happens it, before it gets into the tap, then they, you have no idea if there are pipes now, it, there is hardly a day goes by that you don't drive around Altoona and you don't see the Water Authority digging up somebody, some property. Mm -hmm. Every day of the week I see them all over the place. S some of our pipes are, are the old terracotta pipes. Right. Yeah, that's the, yeah, the and, sewage. And, uh, right, the and water. so the whole thing is that's another boondoggle that's going to come down. Infrastructure, you know, well, well, last year in my own house, uh, and in fact in our neighborhood, we had about 10 houses last year that lost gas, natural gas, yeah. heating our house. And the reason was is the Altoona Water Authority apparently had a leak in their pipes. And also the gas company must have had a leak because <laughs> water got into the gas lines. And yeah. then in the sub-freezing temperatures, the worst time you uh, want to have, have it, no yeah. gas. The, the gas, as it came up out of the ground, froze in the sub-freezing temperatures and literally prevented gas from flowing into our mm -hmm. house. And uh, the, there were about 10 houses in our neighborhood that encountered that situation, yeah. and I guess it's been remedied. Our gas continues to flow this winter. Yeah. Well, but and the <laughs> thing is, is no one likes to pay taxes. I mean, that isn't something that anyone enjoys. But you want to have decent water. You want to have decent infrastructure <laughs> so that that water, by the time it comes to your tap, isn't filled with lead. You want to make sure that you have decent roads and that people aren't getting killed on bridges and, and you need police force and you need I these know. things. There are a lot of things that you need government to provide. It's they're this big, huge anti-government, oh, I hate government, I don't want government to do anything. Well. Imagine the water situation put in the hands of the private sector. <laughs> They're not going to be caring about anyone's safeness. They're not going to care if they put, you know, lead, lead water into a disadvantaged community. They're not going to care about things like that. You need a watchdog situation for the public good. 
there are th certain things that should not be well, but governed by profit. They need to be governed yeah. for the public. Yes, the good. health, safety, and welfare of the people is very important. Well, yeah, uh, uh, apparently in, in Michigan, I guess the people didn't have a say in, in no. the changing of the system because of the emergency, emergency management system put in place by the governor. Yeah. And if they had a say in it, they would have said, no, that would be like around here, taking it from the reservoirs and, and putting the supply into the Junior River. Yeah. How would yeah, that work? Yeah, the, the problem in Flint and also in Detroit, which is another tragedy, is all the jobs have moved out, but the infrastructure and the people are left behind, and there's not enough tax revenue to really fund an adequate uh, government or, as mm -hmm. you're pointing out, an infrastructure. That, and, and like you say, Marty, what the governor of Michigan, they took over control of Flint, yeah. the, the city. Yeah. And people had and, no and, say. And, and they had no say. And in order to save money, <laughs> they took and uh, switched the water from Flint, Michigan, who was formerly getting it from Detroit, who apparently has better water system, yeah. and they were taken out of the Flint River. And uh, that yeah. was to save money, but as we've discovered, I mean, that was... Uh, not really thought through be yeah. because they didn't treat the water from the Flint River and it corroded all the well, water all pipes that then leached all of the lead out. You see, this is the thing that is so onerous about this whole process. Government cannot provide services without income. Exactly. The only income government has is through taxation. Now, I realize people say they hate like heck to pay taxes or too much tax, but the point is we could make things better if we would demand what I call the AA approach. More reasonable allocation and then a strictly public accounting of all the money that's spent. I think that every single legislator, whether it's city, county, state, or national, should have to present on the internet every week of the year on a Friday the amount of money they've spent for whatever they do, and the government should spend, put out how much money we spent in every one of the categories. And that way the public could take a look at what did we allocate and why, and what did you spend and why. But today there's no accountability. We have legislators in Harrisburg that have expense accounts that don't demand receipts, hmm. except for housing, I understand. But can you imagine, unfettered expense account well and 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 the legis a lot of the legislatures at the legislators at the state house they don't want to touch their own pensions but they want oh, to get rid yeah. of state pensions yeah. it's ridiculous they put that special article in in the law <laughs> that would exempt them from this whole new 401k whatever they want to do well we certainly have many other issues that well, I, well yeah you know we uh, haven't talked about I, I just wanted to bring up you know you said at the beginning uh, there doesn't seem to be much discussion right yeah. now well there is a little bit of discussion about uh, uh, what's called the fiscal code and part of the discussion there and this impacts education too it's one thing to appropriate the a total amount of money for K through 12 education but then it needs to be allocated by the state to the school district and there's been a number of discussions now about how you allocate this money what what you come up with and then of yeah. course what we've been talking about is how much money yeah. the state's going to contribute but once you come up with that amount of money then it also is allocated to the school district and uh, the state of Pennsylvania has been operating under basically whoever has power at the That's legislature right. They get the money uh, sent to their local school district. So uh, it's not based upon number of students enrolled or number of disadvantaged students enrolled or anything like that? That's right. In the past, I mean, obviously that's a factor. The more students you have, oh, yeah. uh, you know, it's a factor, but it's not a strict It's uh, not a strict formula. Thing. Now, they have come up because they they realize that this is something that needs to be corrected one pennsylvania is one of the few states that doesn't have a written policy on how money is allocated to each of the school districts and so they've come up with one this was uh, uh, arrived at last year and that's another discussion and, and it includes factors like the number of students 
the poverty disadvantage uh, too. Uh, you know, whether there's handicaps involved, mm. whether they're uh, uh, English, uh, well, foreign language students involved, a number mm -hmm. of uh, students, let's say, that come from households that speak mm -hmm. Spanish. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, those school districts that have a lot of these students, they get extra allocation. There's also uh, a factor in there for the large school districts that are rural that have school buses that have to travel tremendous right, distances. Transportation problems. Yeah, yeah the, the density of the student. Yeah. Uh, you know, so these are areas right now that actually Governor Wolf, uh, who supports this new funding formula, but he does not support it for fiscal year 2015-16. Uh, and the reason he doesn't is because uh, the uh, new formula disadvantaged some of the uh, urban school districts, and they were uh, uh, but under C Governor Corbett shorted in in funding the urban school districts. So Governor Wolf wants to increase the uh, cur urban Allocation. school districts to get to bring back, them back where they up. should have been. Yeah, because well, Philadelphia, especially Corbett. Well, yeah, Philadelphia is a, is, is a tragedy there, and of course Philadelphia. You know, you can't exactly blame the school district because they've been under government, state yeah, been government guy, uh, yeah. leadership, just like Flint, Michigan. The state has been administering the Philadelphia school district over the last years, 10 years, yeah. I, I think. And uh, in fact, they've actually gone to a lot of charter schools in Philadelphia. Yeah, they have. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, well, we, we've got to begin to demand better allocation and better accountability because if you don't have those two factors, like you were just pointing out, if we don't know how and why they're allocating the way they do and why and how they're spending the money, we've got to, we've got to monitor that so we have a, a legitimate argument instead of saying it's a waste. These people who say you can balance a budget by cutting out waste is ridiculous from the standpoint we don't even know how much waste there is. So the whole thing is we need taxes to have good government, good services, and if you don't want them, if you want to have to fix your own potholes, as McGinnis says you should, then don't raise taxes. But if you want good schools, good police, good firemen, good highways, You've got to have the money. Well, we're taking our last break, and when we come back, we are in deep trouble to get through our agenda, but we're <laughs> going to try it. <laughs> Marty, how many minutes do you think it'll take? The circus. Circular the schoolyard. Squad. Welcome back to Plain Speaking. And we know that there are so many things about the budget that we can't even really truly <coughs> codify and talk about today, but the next time we meet, the next program next month, we'll be talking again about it. But right now, we want to get into the politics first. And uh, there, on the national level, it's much more chaotic than it is, I think, at the state level. The candidates who are running for president, you know, on the other side, they have engaged in reckless Republican rhetoric <laughs> for as long as I can say. And we know what's happening. And I would appreciate for the panel to make a comment about what is the state of the national elections when you take a look at how the Democrats are presenting and how the Republicans are presenting. Well, well I just uh, returned from a two-week vacation in South Carolina who, uh, in the Republican side, they're having their primary uh, this coming uh, Saturday a few days from now, mm -hmm. and I had the privilege of watching all of the Republican presidential ads on their television, uh, so so it, it is interesting for me, and basically they, they keep calling each other liars. Yeah. Have they presented uh, anything of a positive nature that says to the American people, here is our position on education, here is our position on jobs, here is what we want to do to, to make sure immigration well, well, works? Well, I know Ted Cruz, of course, he's getting rid of Obamacare. Every single word yes. is going to be <laughs> revoked when he becomes president. So I decided, well, let's see what Ted Cruz's health care plan is. I went into his website, 
Nothing. Nothing. Right. <laughs> Nothing. That's what exactly. they have no and they, he's making that a major issue yeah. in his campaign. And they he's getting no rid of Obamacare, and his substitute is, well, I assume he has something, but it's no. not on his website. No, no. The, the, his his uh, platform is, you're on your own. I, I, you're I, on see, your own. They want That's to privatize it, it so yeah. that you have to go and bid on getting a company that will cover you instead of having a, uh, a health care system provided by the government. They, they want every single American to have to go out and seek their own and pay for their own, and that's obscene. Well, well actually, uh, you know, they kept talking about the government health care system under Obamacare. Actually, it is private under Obamacare. The only thing that Obamacare does for those people who can't afford to pay for insurance, they're allowed to shop. Yes. They, they and actually have a choice. And there is a subsidy by the government. And if they can't afford it, there's a subsidy given by the government and to uh, afford whatever plan they decide. I and mean, and it's, it's been a big success. Right. Well, it's I've been a big success. It's, it's saved money rather than been a, a revenue drainer. It's created jobs instead of eliminated jobs. It has done the opposite of everything that the Republicans have against it. And it hasn't caused a loss of any jobs either. Well, no. no. It has jobs. Big, jobs. You talk right. about lies. Obama. Right. But it's just all lies. You yeah. know, it, it's the same there's, that there's a reason it's called the Affordable Care Act. And you turn it over to the Republicans, it'll be the Unaffordable <laughs> Care Act. Exactly. That's and and the, one of the biggest things is, is a, a private insurer cannot turn you down for a pre-existing condition. Mm -hmm. And that's been one of the true blessings of this bill. And a lot of people that would have gone bankrupt or lost their homes did not lose their homes because they were able to buy affordable health care off the exchanges. Right. So and that's what a failure has been. Well, yeah. well, exactly, and so the voters need to start asking these questions that we're asking. I mean, it sounds great. Let's get rid of Obamacare. It's a, apparently a winning issue because people uh, are voting for people uh, for politicians that are saying this. But if you look at the actual facts, why would you want to get rid of Obamacare? The Republican right. platform is, I'm against everything that Obama has done, and I want to invade every country on the planet. Yeah, that pretty it. much is, is the two-pronged approach. And now look what they're doing uh, at the Supreme Court an nominee now. Jumping in and wanting to bypass the Constitution. R right here, you have yeah. it right here. The Constitution <laughs> of the United States. I carry right that there. with me now every well, day. Well, <laughs> it's in the Constitution that it, it doesn't say unless you're Obama and it's your last term. That's you don't right. get to make a recommendation to the Supreme Court. It does not say that in here. Well, and, and the art is with Antony Scalia, Scalia, he was saying you go to the words of the Constitution. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so there, yeah. there's nothing, as you point out, Marcia, that says that Obama should not make an appointment or at least <laughs> offer the and, candidates and for Justice an appointment. And Justice Kennedy was appointed in the last year Reagan was in office. Right. And... So that's that's just gets and the McConnell whole voted for him. McConnell Pardon. voted for him McCon in that period, and he's now yes. saying we can't do that. Yeah, right. I, I, I was they trying to think of a that. right. I was trying to think of a term that might represent what, how we would review how we would view all of the uh, Republican candidates as they are campaigning for president, and it would push me in the mind of an elementary school playground. Now, see, I think it is a reality TV show, and, and I think that Trump is appealing to people that like to watch the Real Housewives of Orange County. <laughs> I mean, it is, you watch the Democratic debates, whether you agree with what Bernie Sanders or Hillary Clinton says or not, they're discussing issues. They're not saying, I hate your hair, and you're a liar, and you're an old man, and there's none of that kind of thing, you know, with, with Bernie and Hillary. Yeah. They are debating different issues and how they would respond to different national problems as the chief executive, of the, as, as right. the president of the United States, as, as the head of the armed services. You know, and, and then you have the Republicans come out and it's like, well, you're a liar and I'm going to make a pig face and look at you and all this crazy kind of stuff. It's just... Well, well Saturday Night Live encapsulates, encapsulates yes. all of the ridiculous things yeah. that Trump is saying, mm. you know, with the mm. building the wall between Mexico and us and making the Mexicans pay for it. Uh, I don't know if you saw the Saturday Night oh, Live yeah, thing yeah. where, you know, the it's government of Mexico offers him this gigantic mm. check and... Uh, 
Trump objects. He says, oh, no, that's too much. I didn't want that much. Oh, no, you take it, Mr. Trump. I, I mean, all these yeah. statements are ridiculous that he's making. Right. And so the, so the, and the, uh, the comedians yeah. love all, and that's all this the whole stuff. Thing. It's entertainment. And, and you know, one of the things that they have not talked in any great detail about is, is the problem that we have with guns today. You know, each and every one of them says they want to do nothing that would diminish in any capacity any discussion about guns. And I know Marty's very interested in this whole business of guns. Now, he didn't bring us to town today, but but Marty, you want to give us a little brief discussion about this whole idea of guns because every one of those candidates <coughs> wants nothing to do with amending in any fashion or preventing, presiding, presenting any information that would in some way prevent the horror that is happening in this country. Well, uh, we're talking about guns, and I'm, I'm not against guns. I have guns in my house, and I hunted for 40-some years. In fact, I just bought a new pistol uh, for protection. Uh, but uh, we're talking about homegrown terrorism. It says here, angry white men have committed more acts of terrorism on U.S. soil than any other group since 911, but they always want to blame it on the Islam Islamic extremists. But uh, remember Timothy McVeigh, that was before 911. Yes. How many people he killed? He was a white man. And 26 people have been killed by uh, those professing some sort of sympathy for Islamic extremists. And then there have been 352 mass shootings in which four or more people were killed or injured uh, in the United States this last year. Uh, according to a study by the New American Foundation, more Americans have been killed in domestic terrorist attacks by right-wing zealots than jihadists since 9-1-1. So everybody has this idea that the, these Islamic extremists are, are kill, doing all the killing, but a lot of it's done in this country here alone. And when Bill Clinton was in office, he p passed that uh, assault weapons ban, and, but it was only good for 10 years, yep. and George Bush left it expire, and he should have never done that, because a lot of these killings were, were done by these assault weapons. Remember back in the 30s when they had all the, the uh, wars with the machine guns, the mafia. all the criminals? Well, Congress banned machine guns, and nobody saw a problem with that. And you still can't buy a machine gun today, but you can buy an assault weapon. Yeah, and you can buy, and that's the problem with this whole idea. If you if you are concerned about this quote on the terrorism, we've got to look at domestic terrorism as well. The the guy that shot those 20 kids up in Connecticut was it? I mean, yeah. how horrible Newtown. can that be? Newtown, yeah. I mean, how horrible is that? And that wasn't done by the Muslims or the uh, uh, extremists. No. And like you were saying, uh, so I think there has to be some legislation passed that is going to, in some way, monitor who gets a gun. These people who are saying that they, there should be no background checks. And you well, can sell them at the... Well, yeah, the Republicans uh, would not approve the suggestion that people on the watch list for f international air flights, in other words, these are suspected yeah. terrorists, that you should not prevent them from getting guns. I mean, that was well, the recent proposal buy guns. a few months ago, yeah. that people on the watch list should not be allowed to buy weapons, and they and that was defeated as a, I guess, a slippery slope or something. <laughs> I, I, I mean, but but uh, with guns, I mean, actually, the people get shot more often as your spouse or someone yeah. you're living with Family. with a gun. Suicides. Well, this so many suicides are, are caused by a people gun. People have a gun because, available. You know, if you're depressed, I mean, you use yeah. a gun to uh, end your life. Yeah. You're going to be successful. Yeah. If you don't have a gun, maybe you'll slip your wrist and but you'll, you'll a little, probably a little be bit saved. of chance, you, better you, chance of living. In some states, it's, it's easier to buy a gun than cast a boat. Yes, it's getting that way more and yeah. more. Yeah. Or get sued for that yeah. matter. And, and I think what we... But, but, yeah. uh, but the, the problem is, is it's not violating the Second Amendment of the no. Constitution. No, they, they, this they, is they, all about the NRA wanting to make money. This has nothing to do with anybody's constitutional rights being violated. Everyone can still purchase a weapon. It's just that 
if we had some controls on people that should not have them, like people with a history of mental illness, people on the 9-11 watch list. Yeah. It, you mm -hmm. need to have some controls on this. And the mm -hmm. NRA doesn't want to have any controls on it, not because of the Second Amendment of the Constitution. It's because they want to make money. Yeah. Well, they, and they've been the successful. I mean, all yes, the, and they've gun been very sales successful. have brought up under the eight years under Obama. Yeah. So well, and that's a whole different... <laughs> Yeah. There's another thing going on there. Yeah. Well, you know, well, I, well, I know there that. There are people that just do not like <laughs> having an African American in the White House, yeah. period, period, full stop. Yeah. And that, that had a mass exodus to the gun stores, people buying guns. Well, never in the history of America has one political party ever coalesced around an issue like the Republicans have with President Obama. We've had difficulties over the years, but historically, ever since Obama's been president, the Republicans have en masse voted against every single thing he tried to present. Not because it wasn't good for America, but because he presented it. Yeah. And that's a terrible commentary on Americans' government. Well, Never in history has it done where the party has coalesced around that anti-Obama. Well, uh, exactly. Once uh, Obama's no longer president, I think the Republicans are going to lose a lot of their rhetoric because everything is, like you say, being blamed on Obama. Well, well they'll be happy to hate Hillary, or they'll be happy <laughs> to hate Bernie. I mean, well, how, but they they found that that's something that's working for them is being obstructionist. Mm -hmm. That their particular group that that votes for them likes the obstructionism. I mean, I have never heard before, now maybe it has happened in history, but in my life I don't ever remember a party coming out and saying, now some of them have softened their rhetoric on this, but initially when Scalia died, I have never heard a party come out and and say, we are absolutely not going to consider anybody That's right. he puts up for this. Thank We're goodness not they are. going to yeah. do it. And they, I mean, there have been people that have in back rooms said, we're not going to do this. But mm -hmm. they come right out on TV. The body wasn't even cold. And McConnell come out and, and says... And McConnell's coming out saying, we're not going to accept anything. Well, this isn't surprising. Polls show right now that about 40% of the Republicans are convinced that Obama's a Muslim. Yeah. Can now, you believe I, that? I don't know, you know, after seven years of observing the president, how you could conclude that he's a Muslim is just baffling to me. Well, See, because that, you want to believe it. If exactly. you want to believe something, even when a fact is well, staring you in the face, that, that, well, you know, you've talked to Joe Silverman. You know, I mean, well, you do not want to accept that as a fact because... The other thing, which is a lie, comes into your paradigm of how you want to see the world. Uh, it's right. The one thing about the Republicans, they always have an ulterior motive, and the reason they don't want to bring up a candidate because they're hoping they get a Republican in, then they can get another right winger in. They well, do not want that course right. to go the other way. Well, it, it's an, an example of <coughs> reckless Republican rhetoric, <coughs> because every <coughs> every time you <clears throat> Excuse me. Every time you turn on the TV, they're threatening that Muslim fanatics are going to be out killing us all the time. <laughs> Therefore, we all got to carry guns. Fear is the worst condition under which you make a decision. If people are fearful of something, they sometimes make the mo most irrational of course, calls. Yes. And that's what the Republican Party's doing. They're trying to scare people. Obama's going to take your guns. He's never said that. No. And the, the, all these immigrants are going to come in and they're going to kill people. They're going to take your jobs. And that's not true. There are people going back to Mexico in greater numbers than people coming in. There's, and, and there's two things that the Republicans are well known for, and they do a good <coughs> job at it. Fear and smear. Yeah. Well, Ted Cruz, the pro-life candidate, yes. well, he wants to carpet bomb Syria, and he'll find out whether kill all those the kids. sand is going to glow. <laughs> I, I mean, talk about the co you know, contradictory thought process. Well, uh, they're all pro-life till someone's <laughs> born. Well, that's well, and, then once, and then once <laughs> someone's born, they, they then once right. they, they These pro-lifers are not, they're pro-birthers. Yes. And the moment the child is born, the heck with them. You're on your own.
And, and that's, the, that's the whole thing about it. We'll all get those, down to one all minute. those are people who are against abortion, they're for war, which doesn't make and sense. And that's another thing. When did we ever become the savior of the whole world? We can't convert the world to democracy when they've had thousands of years of autocratic rule. And you can't, I, I, had, I had a Republican woman tell me we ought to go over and convert them all to Christianity. <laughs> I mean, you talk about idiotic statements. Well, we're down to the last 30 seconds, and unfortunately, we've had a pretty interesting discussion today, but we're going to be back again next month. We're going to get into more politics and more ways that we think the country could be made better because the Democratic Party is committed to that. The health, safety, and welfare of the American people is in great danger is the way things stand now. If, if we take that playground crowd on the other side, I don't know whom I would even want to envision under my greatest fear being in the White House. So anyway, I thank very much the panel, Marsha, Marty, and George, and we'll be back next month, and uh, we'll try to uh, come up with some ideas about how we can make America better, but it's certainly not by listening to the members of the other side. <laughs> so thank you very much, and folks, thank you for watching, and remember, get your legislators by letting them know, get back to the table, we need a budget. Thank you very much.